I'm here with Mark McCracken, the CEO of CalMac and also soon to be the chair of the U.S. Green Building Council. Thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Could you talk to us about what CalMac does and what, what kinds of technologies you guys are trying to offer uh, to your customers? We've been in the energy storage business for over 30 years now. Uh, essentially, we store cooling in the form of ice uh, for air conditioning buildings. Essentially, you are making ice at night, and then during the day, you're melting the ice in order to cool the building. What that does for you is shift your electric load to nighttime when it's normally half the price. It's also more efficient to generate electricity at night and uh, normally less polluting also. So it's a win. So is this for is this replacing an air conditioning unit? It's not replacing a unit. Uh, normally, it's, it's downsizing the unit. Uh, what it's really doing is it is decoupling the need for cooling from when you create it. So, for instance, just like in a, a hot water heater in your house, you create the hot water the night before, and then it's ready for all the showers in the morning. So you've decoupled when you need it from when you created the, cool, uh, the heat. Uh, in the same way, we create the cooling the night before uh, and have it ready for the building the next day. Um, with standard systems, when you need the cooling is when you create it, and that's why we draw so much power during the hot part of the afternoon and the utilities strain to meet that. And because they're straining so much, they're, they charge a lot for that. So this kind of helps the utility and helps the customer uh, at the same time. Are most of your customers on the commercial side? Yeah, I would say commercial and then uh, schools uh, is a, a very large application. Uh, we have probably 1,500 schools around the country and around the world. So these are big, si these are big systems that are on campuses that, that connect to, to the building, not something that's small that's next to a house. Yes, exactly. Uh, the smallest projects we normally would do would be, a, you know, let's say a high school size uh, uh, building. It can be a single building, but a high school size. And we go from there up to uh, skyscrapers like the new uh, Bank of America Tower in New York City, which is the second tallest building in New York. And what types of, when you sell the system, are you, are you selling it based on how much uh, energy or, or cooling it's going to produce the next day, or are you doing it based on a kilowatt hour savings, or how, how, does, how does that happen? Well, let's just give an example. It's probably the easiest thing. So uh, let's take a big building of a 1,000-ton system. Uh, for a 1,000-ton building, which you know might be an office, large office building or something of that nature, uh, what we would do is install, instead of putting in a thousand ton chiller to create the cooling that get dis gets distributed throughout the building, we might put in a 500 ton chiller and at night run that chiller and create cooling and then during the day run that 500 ton chiller and then melt the ice in order to help that meet the thousand ton load of the building. So Got you it. downsize the amount of cooling uh, a chiller system that you need in order to meet that building's uh, peak demand. Where are you getting the water? Well, the water goes into our tanks and then never leaves the tank. So basically what we, what we make is a uh, all-plastic tank that's completely insulated on all sides. And in that tank, we put three miles of plastic tubing. Uh, the tank itself is about eight foot diameter, eight foot high. Um, that tubing in the tank uh, takes up 10% of the volume of the tank, 80% of the volume is water, and then there's about 10% expansion space because when you freeze the water to ice, uh, it, it takes up a little bit more volume. So we might put one of these tanks on a job uh, or 100 of these tanks on a job depending on how big the building is. So the water never goes anywhere. It just sits in the tank and changes state from uh, water to ice and then back to water again. What does go in and out of the tank is a coolant solution, which goes through the tubing, and at night it goes through the tubing at a low temperature, like about 25 Fahrenheit, so the water surrounding the tubes freeze to ice. And then during the daytime, you put warm liquid through that tubing, and now it will melt the ice, and that 
that coolant, that liquid will now circulate to the building and cool the building. So the occupant never sees any difference. It's still cool air coming out of a, a you know, a, a, a grill in the ceiling. Uh, but that creation of the cooling happened the night before mainly. So there's really not going to be any type of an impact on the customer's water bill because the moment the water's there, you're never going to really ever need it again. Oh, exactly. Or need to add more, rather. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so I guess the, the big uh, issue that you guys are trying to tackle is, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, peak demand? Yeah, peak demand is a huge problem for the utilities. Um, in, in most areas of the country, the last... 20% of generation uh, that's needed to be given uh, by the utilities, we only need that for less than 2% of the entire year. So they have to invest a tremendous amount of money in generation and wires and, and transformers for a very, very short period of time. So what we try to do and can do is to knock off the peaks of the buildings. And so the more uh, buildings we get installed, we'll be able to address that. Now, this entire problem is getting compounded greatly uh, when you start adding renewable energy to the grid. So renewable energy like wind, wind mainly blows at nighttime. Well, at nighttime, there's not a big need for power, okay? And the mm -hmm. wind is not blowing during the peak of the day, which is when the utilities need the power the most. So that if we have wind blowing at night, we can take that electricity, run it to the building, run these compressors, create cooling, right, and store the cooling, uh, and then the next day you don't need those electrons to create the cooling because we've already created and have it sitting at the building. So, so you're, branding your, you're really branding your solution almost as a bridge between renewable energy generation and the end user. Ex exactly. Um, energy storage is going to be hugely important as we move towards renewable, and the reason is simply because Fossil fuels are not just energy. They're stored. It's a form of stored energy. And so if we're going to try to replace it with things like real energy, which is solar, which is hot, or wind, which is moving, you know, that's kinetic energy, we're also going to have to replace the storage capability of that fossil fuel in order to really replace it. Our entire grid is based upon stored energy, energy being ready to go, when we need more power. So energy storage uh, on the grid side of the, of the electric meter and on the building side are going to be needed. Um, we store energy, our company does, on the building side of the meter, and that happens to be the least expensive way uh, to store the energy. So we'll be, we're going to see in the future a lot more storage at buildings. We're also going to need storage on the grid, and there's a number of different ways to do that. Yeah, I mean, that that's definitely something I think the entire country is dealing with is the fact that, you know, people are having to really get creative about energy storage solutions because the cost of energy storage is so high. I'm curious to know, you know, let's go with the thousand tons of cooling example that you were talking about a little bit earlier. With your solution, what type of, can you give us a range of dollars saved in a month that somebody might be able to see, you know, with, with cutting that peak demand? Sure. Um, I'm just trying to do some numbers in my head right now, but you would probably be saving um, in, in a New York City application uh, with that type size building. You might be saving anywhere from a quarter million dollars a year to uh, uh, a half a million dollars a year in electricity. So it's real dollars. Oh, it's serious dollars. Uh, it is very expensive to create and deliver power at peak. Uh, right now, most utilities kind of average it out a little bit for you. Um, they do charge you more during the day than they do at nighttime, and that day to night is usually about 50% when you calculate everything in. Um, if they actually go to real-time pricing, on those really hot peak days, um, the cost of getting that electricity to you is probably 10 times what it is at nighttime. So it's not a, a two times multiplier, it's a, it's a 10 times multiplier. So uh, as we move towards you know, real-time uh, real pricing, 
uh, you're going to see bigger swings between uh, the real hot days and the, and the cooler days. So your solution is really going to be most effective in areas where there is going to be more cooling. Well, it's interesting uh, that even in the northern climates, I mean, you think about Boston uh, versus, let's say, Miami, you certainly need more air conditioning uh, during the entire year in Miami versus uh, New England. But the peakiness of New England is actually very, very extreme. So um, when they do need that uh, heating, uh, the, the cooling from the, uh, uh, in, in the hot part of the summer, uh, their peaks are extremely high. Uh, for instance, the New England grid, as I said before, 21% of the, you know, the last highest uh, amount of power that they need they only need for less than 2% of the hours. So it's still very peaky. So you, you need to be able to chop the air conditioning peaks off of, of, of everywhere. You'll mm -hmm. have more months of application in uh, Miami than you will in, in Boston, but the KW reduction is still the same. Do state and federal governments uh, help a business like you out with incentives or laws that are in place so that you can get out there faster? They are certainly moving in that direction. There have been quite a number of incentives on the renewable energy side. For instance, on the photovoltaic, the solar collectors going up on the roof, there are major, major incentives out there, both on the federal side and, and state by state. There, to date, has been uh, very little, if any, uh, for energy storage, which is not, uh, not smart because, uh, you know, with the wind has been built, for instance, in West Texas, and yet 12% of the hours last year in West Texas, the price of electricity was zero or less, and that was because they had so much wind available and no place for the power to go that they have to give it away or even actually pay you to take the power because it doesn't correspond with when they need the power. Um, so the good news is that certain states, uh, like California, uh, have now started to uh, analyze and are probably moving forward with incentives uh, for energy storage, both on the grid side and on building side. There's been certain legislation there that is now ordering the, uh, the uh, California utility regulators to uh, analyze this carefully and, and come out with uh, uh, a program that will encourage storage. Because if you encourage storage and have incentives for storage, you will be able to multiply the effect or the effectiveness of the renewable energy that they've already been subsidizing. Interesting. And and I guess I guess the other thing too is is that if you guys are already uh, out there selling energy storage solutions and you've been in business for as long as you have with very little help from the government, then if the government ever decides to really turn to turn the focus uh, towards you know finding better solutions and finding more incentives for for your industry, then you just get there a lot faster. Exactly. I mean we've you know we do, as I said, have about thirty five hundred installations around the world and in thirty six countries. so, we are out there, but it's been a very slow process, and we sell, you know, specifically just on, you know, energy and energy cost savings uh, for uh, for building owners. Uh, what's Does going to happen now is, uh, with getting some incentives in there, we will accelerate it to the point where we can really start utilizing the renewable uh, renewable sources, making them reliable and and be in there and starting to have a, a very positive effect on, uh, on the environment. Does, are there any points, uh, th does any customer get, a, get additional points for LEED certification for using your system? Absolutely, LEED uh, is based on energy cost reduction uh, in the new construction side. And so since power is uh, half price at night, uh, we can have a very good impact on the LEED uh, EA credits or the energy and atmosphere credits. So yes, it's a very, very positive thing. There's not a lot of things, or there's not a lot of things that have a big impact on uh, the energy costs. 
um, uh, but thermal storage happens to be one of them. Well, I have to ask you, since you're about to come on board um, with, with uh, Green Building Council, but what can we start to expect? What's on the agenda for 2011? I think the most exciting thing is that uh, we are certifying, so not people registering to do a building, uh, but we are actually certifying. So people having gone through the process and getting a uh, certified silver, gold, or platinum rating, uh, over a million square feet a day. That's uh, incredible. Which is just an amazing number, and it really shows that we are creating market transformation because it is not, you know, it doesn't matter that much whether it was gold or silver or platinum. That is a lot of people uh, thinking about and actually taking action, and the action is having a positive effect, and so it is changing the way buildings are being constructed and how waste is being uh, uh, created and, and eliminated, and right down the line, uh, it's quite amazing. So I'm, I'm curious, um, this is actually going to be the final question, and it's something that we ask of everyone in the series. Why is it that you do what you do? Why are you in the industry that you're in? Well, it's kind of, I would say, in the blood. Uh, I have our, our home movies uh, from when I was growing up, and there's one of me uh, kicking a soccer ball for the first time when I'm one, and that was 1955. And on that video, the next video is the first solar energy convention in Phoenix, Arizona, in 1955, and my father was there showing uh, his wares. He was a terrific inventor. And his, my other brother is one of the top scientists in the world on climate change. Uh, it's it's real. And so why I do, I think it's just it's critical. Uh, we are having such a big effect on, on the planet. Uh, the naysayers are wrong, and uh, it I think that's one of the things that's spectacular about going to Greenville and, and that uh, which is the USGBC's show which we just had in Chicago people get it and they're just trying to do the right thing trying to take us in a better direction and I just love being a part of that well, well Mark I appreciate you telling us a little bit about the company and, and kind of why you are putting your efforts towards these types of issues thanks so much for the time today and let's definitely stay in touch you're welcome. Thanks very much.